results of a randomized controlled trial conducted in Uganda from 2011 to 2013 and published in Nature in mid-2017 suggests paying people to preserve trees on their land results in economic benefits that are double the money spent on these payments. In this case, $20,000 was paid to 180 people across 60 Ugandan villages in exchange for them not cutting down trees on their land. This added up to about $28 per hectare of land preserved per year, which was about the same amount of money the people involved in the study would have earned on average from cutting down these trees for timber. These people were paid at the end of each year after it was determined that they had adhered to the terms of the agreement, and the study was paid for by the Ugandan government using funds from the United Nations. Ultimately, it was determined that it cost the government about 46 cents to avoid releasing a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for two years via this program, which measures up favorably to an estimate made by the U.S. Environmental Agency that it's worth about $1.11 to avoid releasing a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for two years. This metric, often called the social cost of carbon, takes into account the damage caused by each unit of carbon in the atmosphere based on its impact on the environment and consequently its damage to the economy. So based on that method of measurement at least, this program realized $1.11 worth of economic value for every 46 cents spent. Not a bad return on investment. And importantly, this study exclusively measured the two years during which it took place, rather than a theoretical extended preservation of these trees. So rather than being paid to, in theory, set aside a forest forever, or for a generation, or even a decade, over which time all sorts of things could happen to the supposedly protected, non-harvested trees, this method of measurement only takes into account the value of not releasing that carbon for two years. So the measurements here are considered to be a lot more accurate and precise than is the case for some other projects that have attempted to gauge the benefits of payment for preservation in different contexts around the world. A meta-analysis of similar studies that was published in 2016 indicated on average these sorts of programs have a beneficial initial effect, but also a beneficial sustained effect over time. The type of incentive provided to those who are expected not to take advantage of natural resources matters quite a bit, as does the type of behavior being incentivized. Are they being asked to recycle, change their travel behaviors, not cut down some trees? What people are asked to do matters in terms of outcomes, as does what they're being promised if they make these adjustments. Some types of behaviors are actually more effectively and consistently influenced by non-financial incentives. Travel-related behaviors, for instance, seem to be nudged more effectively by non-financial incentives, especially over time, than monetary incentives. But much of the research in this space is limited at the moment, so there's a chance, for instance, being offered a great deal of money would work better than non-financial incentives, like better seating on public transit, while those non-financial benefits work better than a small amount of money. We won't really know for certain about any of this until more research is done, and there's a good chance that even then some of the findings will only be applicable in some contexts, and even those not consistently or universally within said contexts. What I'd like to talk about today are some recent real-world applications of this general concept and how such models are evolving. <laughs> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also become a member at understandery.com 
but you can find an array of options, both monetary and non-monetary, at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from Quartz, and it's entitled Gabon's Rainforest Payments are a Creative New Model for Conservation. The payments referenced in that headline were announced back in June of 2021, and the story is that the African nation of Gabon, which is located on the western coast of the continent, about midway down along the equator, has made a deal with Norway under the auspices of a United Nations program called the Central African Forest Initiative, or CAFI. The idea behind CAFI is that governments in heavily forested portions of Africa should be paid by wealthier nations to preserve those forests. It's often economically beneficial for governments to exploit their natural resources. After all, that's how a lot of today's wealthy nations became wealthy, by basically digging up and cutting down and processing everything they could discover and refine into sellable goods. Today, though, we have a far better understanding of the consequences of such exploitation, and there are nations that want to scale up their economies to become wealthier, to build better infrastructure, have more food and more options. But to do so, they would likely need to cut down their trees, dig up their ore, burn or sell their coal. This initiative is meant to provide economic incentives to these countries not to do that. And the guiding theory is if they're paid enough, it will make more sense for them not to exploit these resources and to instead take this money and build up their economies and infrastructure the way they're keen to do without contributing to the larger global climate and environmental crisis. This initial deal between Norway and Gabon has the former paying a total of $150 million to the latter to not cut down their rainforests. And important context here is that Gabon has about 12% of the world's rainforests within its borders. This is considered to be a good use of money because the world's rainforests absorb more than three times the carbon emitted by the UK, so they're substantial carbon sinks. And as they're cut down, not only do they release a bunch of carbon because of all that cutting and burning and processing and the carbon they already have stored, but we also lose a natural sponge that would otherwise continuously soak up carbon, which then slows some of the negative processes we're currently trying to slow and stop globally. This is a model that likely won't be replicated in this exact shape throughout Africa, much less throughout the world. Gabon is unusually capable of accepting this kind of deal because it's a relatively wealthy country, the fourth wealthiest on the continent, and it has both a small population and large oil exports, so they're doing okay, all things considered. Thus, they're able to weigh the benefits of such an offer differently than other nations which may be more reliant on exploiting their local rainforest resources because they either have more massive populations to sustain or fewer other resources they can tap for profits. Let's talk about some big picture points that are important for understanding this deal, but also what it might mean and feed into moving forward. First, is African nations bear little responsibility on average compared to other countries around the world for the climate emergency that we're facing? Yes, they play a role, and oil exporting countries in particular bear an outsized role compared to other African nations, but less wealthy countries in general produce and consume a whole lot less than wealthy countries. That production and consumption is where we run into problems in terms of emissions, so the poorer parts of the world tend to, in aggregate, churn relatively little CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere compared to wealthier parts of the world. 
Such regions are also more likely to suffer negative consequences from global climate change, and many already have. Severe droughts, in particular, are wreaking havoc in parts of Africa, and that combined with extreme temperatures have triggered cataclysmic famines in parts of Ethiopia and Madagascar. Regional conflicts can amplify these issues, as is the case in northern Ethiopia, but it's expected in the coming decade, previously abnormal events like severe droughts that kill hundreds of thousands or millions of people will become every few years events rather than landing every few decades. And that may further disrupt things by sparking mass migrations of people trying to not starve to death, trying to not die from extreme, unsurvivable heat. Such migrations can, in turn, put more pressure on resources and infrastructure wherever they go, rolling these problems from place to place, causing a cascade of damage in a part of the world which, again, bears a lot less responsibility for these issues than wealthier regions. So part of the logic behind this sort of payment scheme is that countries in such regions should have carrot incentives, not stick incentives whenever possible. Rather than threatening to punish countries that understandably want to build up their land and their people, wealthier countries which have accumulated that wealth, in part by amplifying these very issues, should pay to keep these resources from being exploited whenever possible. This, in theory at least, can stimulate beneficial changes without further punishing nations that are basically inclined to do the things everyone else has done, but which have the misfortune of attempting to do today a moment when doing so is perceptually less okay than it would have been a half century ago. Second is that this plan has been years in the making. And while part of that time has been spent figuring out all the details, including what will be protected and how much money will change hands, and when, a significant chunk of it has been focused on figuring out how to monitor and validate Gabon's adherence to this agreement, which is not an easy process when you're talking about tracking the preservation or failure to preserve sprawling natural ecosystems like rainforests. Gabon has already, in recent years, created 13 national parks as part of an effort to dissuade illegal loggers from coming in and cutting down trees for personal profit. The establishment of these parks allowed them to inflict larger legal penalties on those who might do such cutting in especially vulnerable regions, and that seemed to have some impact on this issue. On the other hand, the Gabonese government has also said it intends to keep harvesting its rainforests for timber while building out its timber industry. There's reason to be concerned, then, that their timber industry priorities might at some point supersede preservation plans, resulting in either payments for nothing or a program that fizzles before its intended completion date. This is part of why tracking outcomes is so important, and most contemporary tracking efforts make use of satellite imagery to keep tabs on forest cover, which is useful up to a point in that satellite images these days can show individual trees without too much trouble. This allows those who are validating Gabonese adherence to the agreement to assess what's going on and where and what's not, which might then allow the government to make changes to bring them back into alignment with their contract if things do start to go sideways against their wishes. Satellite tracking can sometimes produce incomplete data, though, which can lead to incorrect assumptions about adherence or the causes of non-adherence. Which brings me to a third point, that in some cases, the best of intentions can result in less than ideal outcomes no matter how valiantly the government in question tries to preserve their forests. Back in July, 86 large wildfires roared through 12 western U.S. states, burning gobs of forests, including some that were part of carbon credit schemes. A 400,000-acre carbon credit project in Oregon lost 24% of its total credited trees, and offset paid forests in Washington and California likewise went up in smoke over the course of just a few weeks, 
This was not entirely unexpected, as one of the consequences of global climate change is an increase in extreme weather events, like hurricanes and tornadoes and blizzards, and yes, wildfires. But the scale of it brought a lot of uncomfortable realities to the forefront of public attention and illuminated a lot of gaps and flaws in existing wildfire prevention and control methods that we have at our disposal. Carbon credits, by the way, are another permutation of the same concept of paying for preservation. In this case, the most typical current version of climate credit models allow owners of land to commit to preserving that land, and in exchange, they get credits for each ton of CO2 not generated from timber harvesting, or in some cases for the CO2 these trees pull out of the atmosphere just by existing. These credits can then be sold as an asset to mostly corporate entities, but also sometimes governments or organizations, to offset their other activities which produce CO2. So if I'm a steel maker and my production of steel produces 100 tons of CO2, which is just a random number that I'm using for this example, I could buy 100 tons worth of carbon credits from one of these landowners who have set aside their forests for this purpose. And I can then claim to be carbon neutral. I'm still doing what I was doing before, but I am, according to the tenets of this concept, offsetting those activities by paying to have the requisite quantity of trees protected. Unfortunately, as illustrated by those wildfires, we're not only competing with human-caused harvesting of these trees and other natural carbon sinks, but also destruction caused by natural events that increasingly are amplified by the swirl of climate-augmented variables which unfortunately likely represent our new normal. So an offset ton of carbon isn't necessarily permanently offset. And a lot of the money being funneled into these sorts of programs, though well-meaning, don't necessarily do a whole lot longer term, or in some cases even shorter term, as there is no unified global carbon market. And the scattershot nature of existing markets means there are quite a few different methods of measuring and assessing and keeping track of these resources, and quite a lot of loopholes as well. So the relative quality of offsets varies substantially from place to place. Another model that we're seeing a lot of at the moment is the investment in poorer regions, which again will be hardest hit by these consequences while also bearing the least responsibility for them. South America in particular is seeing a lot of investment proposals in the neighborhood of trillions of dollars of theoretical funds heading their way from wealthier governments and corporate entities. Unfortunately, many of these commitments are either ill-defined, general statements of intent to send a bunch of money to that part of the world at some point without specifics, or their borderline scams, efforts that carry a whiff of greenness and renewability, but which in reality are extractive and polluting, and in some cases both destructive and abusive to local ecosystems and people, despite having been greenwashed, to seem more acceptable. It's possible some of these investments will actually pan out, and the money being funneled into the region will incentivize more environmentally friendly behaviors by catalyzing a shift toward greener efforts of the kinds that these investors are prioritizing. Rather than being paid to preserve forests, folks might be paid to build solar farms and wind turbines, which can at times have the same net effect, as it may reduce the necessity to cull local resources for money and energy. There are blended versions of these models as well, and we're just beginning to see early versions of some hybrid approaches roll out in 2021. The African nation of Mozambique, for instance, is the first country to work with the World Bank in their Forest Carbon Partnership Facility Program, which essentially pays them to reduce carbon emissions through community-based efforts, which often overlap with economic efforts like the scaling up of sustainable industries and infrastructure, converting polluting and destructive harvesting techniques to more sustainable models of the same, for instance. 
which could result in both more local business investments in greener efforts, but also direct payments that incentivize infrastructural investments in these sorts of businesses early on. The Central American country of Belize has also come up with an interesting hybrid approach to being paid for preservation, using what are often called blue bonds to essentially swap debt for local environmental investments, committing to protecting the Northern Hemisphere's largest barrier reef in exchange for hundreds of millions of dollars worth of debt relief, allowing them to turn an investment of tens of millions of dollars for preservation infrastructure into something like $250 million in debt to other nations that they no longer have to pay, as long as they continue to adhere to the terms of the agreement. There's a chance that by incentivizing preservation in this way, we may accidentally create a counter-incentive to consume or destroy local natural resources in an attempt to essentially blackmail those who run these programs into including their country or government or industry in them. This is something we already saw to a limited degree when Brazil's president demanded money from the rest of the world to protect the Amazon rainforest from his own oft-favored logging and cattle ranching efforts. But it's not unthinkable that small entities could make, for instance, investments in logging infrastructure in the hope that it will pay off not in timber revenue, but in payments from wealthy countries and global organizations to not develop it any further. Unintentionally toxic incentives of this kind are a possibility any time a new set of policies and sources of wealth emerge. So there's probably not a real certain way around that. Also possible is that the wealthy world will lean on such programs as overt evidence of their effort to solve this problem while continuing, in the background, to behave the way they always have. These efforts are worthwhile and impactful unto themselves, but again, much of the damage is being caused by wealthier nations. So if wealthier governments don't make changes at home as well, this progression toward worse and worse outcomes is unlikely to slow or stop, no matter how many clever preservation schemes we come up with. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. You can find a list of different ways to help support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness by Kristen Radke. I won't give too many specifics because I don't want to ruin it, and it's a relatively short book. It's a pretty quick read. But it is a lovely meditation from several different angles on the concept of loneliness, and I think it might be particularly useful or enlightening or encouraging even for some people, especially right now. At a time in which loneliness is an aspect of what's being called the hidden pandemic of depression and psychological issues that a lot of people are suffering at this time of heightened uncertainty, and at a moment in which friendships and relationships in general are being reassessed and recalibrated and changed in so many different ways by our technologies, but also the happenings around the world and adjustments to our social dynamics as well. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness by Kristen Radke. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find a portfolio of my other work, including my other podcasts, at understandery.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.